Hello, Bruce Williams again. You know, it's been a while since I've put up any lectures on surgical pathology topics. And I've come across an incidental finding, which is an interesting little lesion. And if you don't know about something, you'll never be able to diagnose it. So hopefully I'll bring it to your attention for the first time. And the next time you see one, you'll be able to make the correct diagnosis. This case was presented as case number three in the JPC's Wednesday slide conference of 2018-2019 in conference two and was submitted by the Institute of Pathology in the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Leipzig. This lesion was removed during a routine dental cleaning on a 12-year-old Spanish Greyhound. Other than this small tonsillar mass, the animal was just fine. The palatine tonsil, which in dogs, cats, and men, are the two that hide in little crypts at the back of the throat as opposed to the very large palatine tonsil of pigs, which actually is on the palate, was enlarged up to almost four centimeters. It was pedunculated, polypoid, and was an odd color. These absolutely wonderful gross photos from the University of Leipzig showed what it appeared, and it appears to have been excised at this particular stalk. When we look at the cut section, you can see the lymphoid tissue that characterizes the tonsil and actually even some white areas which are concentrations of lymphoid cells and likely represent lymphoid follicles examined at subgross. The core of the tonsil is markedly expanded, somewhat whitish due to an accumulation of fibrous connective tissue and has the appearance of a sponge with large dilated vascular channels. If we look at the virtual slide of this tonsil, they describe a polyp. This could just as easily be cross-sectioned through the entire tonsil. It's very difficult to tell on this one particular section. But it corresponds very nicely to the gross picture with the excised area over here on the left and the rows of lymphoid follicles, which are adjacent to the squamous mucosal epithelium, which forms the top of the tonsil. Just a quick review of tonsils. Tonsils have no drainage capability. They have no defensive capability. They don't drain the oral cavity or the nasal cavity. All that material goes to the various lymph nodes around the oral cavity. These would include the submandibular lymph nodes, the superficial cervical lymph nodes, the mental lymph nodes, and a couple of other lymph nodes. The reason the tonsil doesn't drain anything is because it has no afferent lymphatics. Nothing goes to the tonsil, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. At a slightly higher magnification, we can see the normal follicles of the tonsil with a condensed area of T-zone proliferation and very large areas of proliferating B cells. The tonsil examines antigens which come into the mouth and are dissolved in saliva and can produce all five types of immunoglobulins as well as can produce a very profound T cell response even better than some T-cell responses that occur in the peripheral blood. The lymphocytes often extend up and into the overlying mucosal epithelium. This is very normal for a tonsil. This particular tonsil I would consider as hyperplastic. You can often see an accumulation of keratin down within the lymphoid follicles. Some people call these crypt abscesses, but I don't like that term very well. Whenever you get a lot of keratin accumulated anywhere, you might have a few neutrophils. That doesn't upset me. And so the follicular structures are hyperplastic, but otherwise very normal. 
one other key to this particular lesion is the expansion of the core of the tonsil by these anastomosing and interconnecting vessels which are lined by a flat endothelium are generally devoid of erythrocytes. This is obviously a blood vessel here and these would be interpreted as lymph vessels. There's a little bit of fibrin, a couple of neutrophils, excuse me, a couple of lymphocytes within them. That's what you expect with sectioning and that doesn't upset me much. So we have a large, very large tonsil which is primarily caused by a large number of interconnecting lymph vessels within its core. This is very characteristic of a lymphangiomatous tonsillar polyp. To definitively identify the entity of those endothelial cells as to whether they are vascular endothelium from blood vessels or from lymphatic vessels. The contributors were kind enough to run a couple of immunostains which are specific for lymphatic endothelium including lymphatic vessel endothelial hyaluronan receptor 1 and the Prospero Homeo Box 1 marker which is also a marker for lymphatic endothelium used in humans. Well, it's a simple entity, but let's talk about it for just a minute. This is a lymphangiomatous tonsillar polyp, and it's of uncertain etiology. It's not commonly diagnosed, but I think most people don't know about it or don't recognize it when they see it, and certainly tonsils do not comprise a significant portion of my surgical pathology caseload. There are a number of different opinions as to what these actually represent, some people believe that these are hamartomas, hamartomas being an abnormal concentration of a tissue normal to a, a specific location. Obviously, lymph vessels are normal to the tonsil. Every tonsils have them, and this one obviously has too much, as well as too much of the intervening lymphoid tissue. I have no problem with people who think that these are hamartomas. Uh, The arrangement's incredibly regular. They seem to be the same size, so it doesn't seem to just be a lot of tissue thrown in there. But I often will look at vascular lesions, which are somewhat similar in the skin, and call those hamartomas as well, just for simplicity, to imply that they are not tumors, but they're actually normal malformations. Other people, and I think I probably share this opinion, believe that this is a lesion that follows chronic lymphatic obstruction with increased pressure as a result of recurrent tonsillitis. But no matter what you, which of these you ascribe to, as long as you don't call it a neoplasm, you're in pretty good shape. And I think that you can make the diagnosis of lymphangiomatous tonsillar polyp without having to take a stand on this. There are a couple rule outs that you probably should consider. A lymphangioma or a benign neoplasm of lymphoid tissue is certainly a possibility here. The other very rare differential is one that has been described much better in human medication but or human medicine, but was described a number of years ago by Dr. Howard Gelberg and Dr. Beth Valentine, the Oregon State University in association with a dog, and that would be nodal angiomatosis. The lesion is very similar, but the lymph, the endothelium would be blood vessel endothelium. It's thought to result, once again, from obstruction of lymphatic or venous drainage, which with actual transformation of those endothelial cells from lymphatic to blood vessels. They become interconnected endothelial line channels in a plexiform pattern which would contain blood as opposed to what we're seeing here. Before we leave this rather simple but interesting 
little surgical pathology case. I want to mention a couple of other things that we already referred to about tonsils. There's also a nice lecture on the C.L. Davis Foundation YouTube and Facebook page on gross pathology of tonsils if you're more interested in learning about the tonsil. As we said before, the tonsil doesn't have any afferent lymphatics, so it doesn't drain anything from the oral and nasal cavity, and they don't get metastatic tumors. Nothing can get to the tonsil. All of the tumors that you will ever see in the tonsil arise from normal structures, which would include lymphoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and the very rare hemangiosarcomas and lymphangiomas or lymphangiosarcomas. They provide a defensive aspect only in terms of cell-mediated and humoral immunity in the oral cavity because they sample antigens dissolved in saliva and the inherent T cells and B cells can proliferate or produce antibodies fairly rapidly. A number of viruses and bacteria will use tonsils as a portal of entry, and I think that this is best demonstrated in pigs with the pseudorabies virus, the hog cholera virus, and various parvoviruses and a number of species utilizing the tonsil to infect lymphocytes and the occasional macrophages as they enter the body. A couple of bacteria may be held in the tonsil as a reservoir, once again, especially in pigs, and I think about erysipelas rhusiopathy, streptococcus suis, and a number of salmonella. And I'm sure there are a lot of other organisms that like to use tonsils as a handy way to infect the body. There aren't a lot of things that you'll diagnose in terms of tonsils. And acute versus chronic tonsillitis is something that you shouldn't have any trouble with. Acute tonsillitis generally is a lot of neutrophils, and this may represent a bacterial infection a peritonsillar abscess, where the abscess is actually in the crypt, but can locally invade the tonsil. In cases of chronic tonsillitis, you may say, see enlarged tonsils, as we see here, and it's very difficult to tell that from tonsillar hyperplasia, because there's no acute inflammation, and you always have a lot of lymphocytes, some plasma cells, and macrophages in just about any tonsil. Well, that concludes today's lecture. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I look forward to posting more surgical pathology topics on the Davis Foundation Facebook page and YouTube channel. Have a great day.